got something in my eye. That's better. Well, as the higher mammals, we're able to take our finger and poke ourselves in the eye, actually to rub our eye, to get foreign matter out. Whereas animals, the lower mammals, including the lower primates, gorillas, chimpanzees, the monkeys, all quadruped animals, those that walk on all fours, birds, reptiles, amphibians, all have a nictitating membrane. It's nature's windshield wiper for the eyes. On the deer, that will be located in the front corner here, and I'm going to apply it, and I'm going to explain different ways in which to create this most important detail. It's a small detail, and unfortunately it's overlooked by many. I tend to concentrate on the small details as well as the overall big picture when I'm doing a mount. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this little nature's lesson. As can be seen in this photo, which is the photo of a live white-tailed deer's eye, you can see the placement of the nictitating membrane and ahead of it in the very corner is a little fleshy portion called the lacrimal caruncula and that is that same little pink mass that you see in the very front corner of your own eye. Now I'm going to have some photos show up that have been labeled just for this demonstration.
What I have laid out here on my table are some of the commercial uh, nictitating membranes that are available. Now, these were produced by uh, Brian Epley of the uh, Ohio Taxidermy Supply Company, formerly Buckeye Mannequins. These are a non-rigid plastic, in other words, a quite flexible plastic. They're molded in a black plastic. I believe they're injection molded. They come in three sizes. There's the large, of course, here at the bottom. Medium, which is more of a size you'd want to use in a deer. And the smallest size of all. Okay. That being said, when using the medium, or the number five, for a deer, it is best to actually not incorporate the entire thing, but to cut off the ends at slight angles and use the center portion in the corner of the eye. Okay, with those out of the way, allow me now to turn your attention to dried natural nictitating membranes. And that would be these little fellows right here. Now, after the cape is removed from the skull, and only after it's been beamed, all the heavy flesh removed, and put aside to get ready to put onto the salt rack, do I go back and dissect the actual nictitating membranes from the eyes of the deer. They are then, while wet, attached to this old set of glass eyes, still in a blister pack, and the reason I keep the plastic intact is because it makes it easier to remove them when they dry. Okay. That being said, there are a couple of ways to handle using the natural nictitating membranes. The first thing you can do, you can soak them, soak them up in warm water. There's really no, no preserving involved with these. I use them basically straight like this. I will, however, at times, soak them up in warm water, put them over the glass eyes that, I, that I'm going to be using in the mount. In these cases, it's the, uh, the IQ, the Tahikin IQ 250, or 250 IQ, I should say. I, and I'll let them dry against those. And then I'll make sure to use the same right and left nictitating membrane on the eyes that they were dried against. Uh, they can also be dipped into Mod Podge to coat them, and that will make them slightly flexible. Uh -huh. however, you, however you choose to incorporate these into the mount, um, the first thing to do is they also need to be trimmed. I need to cut off a certain amount from here and a certain amount or just so much from the opposite end. That then goes into the front corner of the eyes after the deer's eyes are mounted over the clay. Okay, here is one of the nictitating membranes that has been mostly trimmed. I used a little toenail clipper to trim the thick skin. Okay, now I set up, I've gone and set up Play work around a glass eye here for this demonstration. Now, if you use the tuck method, you will be best served to install the nictitating membrane after the skin has been applied. All right. If you use the normal, regular, old-fashioned eye setting method, it's real simple to install the nictitating membrane no matter what method you use to make the installation one thing is certain some of the clay needs to be moved away from the glass eye to do that I take my modeling tool I cut in I try not to lift the clay away from the glass eye at all what I want to do is just get in there and make a slot for the nictitating membrane. Now this is an oil-based clay so it does not 
function quite the same as critter clay in that it'll stick to the tools a little more may make it a little more difficult we take this what looks like basically a fingernail clipping push it up into the clay at the top slide it down at the bottom like so remembering from the references that it goes in at an angle towards the top of the eye you can see that right there it goes in at an angle like so of course the modeling tool exaggerates it just a bit but you can fiddle with it and fuss with it a bit until the settings of the membrane match the nictitating membrane in the photos that may mean taking it out resetting it you want to get it set just right no matter how long you've been doing this it takes a little bit of time this now this is installation of a natural here we go a natural nictitating membrane now I want to reposition it again one more time I want to pull the bottom edge further out than the top Use a brush to push the top in while I'm holding the bottom. I'll see if this works. Ah, it's not going to work. Okay. Let's just get this in here. There we go. Okay, we got it. Now I'm just going to reshape the lids against the eye again, including the nictitating membrane. Just want to push the clay back down against the glass eye and the nictitating membrane. And as you can see we've got it just like so. I say the fact that I'm using oil-based clay makes it stick to the tools the way critter clay does not. Which is another reason why oil-based clay is not your best choice for general taxidermy use. And there we have it. I hope that's showing up on camera really well. Yep. All right. That's the installation of a natural nictitating membrane. And it is also the same process to install a plastic nictitating membrane. Now on the little deer, I'm going to use, I'm going to sculpt the nictitating membrane in place. I'm going to be using the black epoxy sculpt mixed with a little bit of brown well here we are about to put some of the finishing touches on the eyes of this little white tail the first thing that I want to show is the amount of epoxy that I mixed up for the purpose. This is a mixture of half and half mixture of the brown and black epoxy sculpt. This is mixed with the hardener. A lot less than this is actually going to be used for the nictitating membranes. First thing I want to do is get it as flat as I possibly can. I just keep pressing it between my fingers. Now I'm not going to wet my fingers with water. If it sticks and tears, it sticks and tears. I just need it very, very, very thin. Now I'm going to cut a little piece off of this. 
and I'm simply going to use my modeling tool to do it. It's going to cut off a little piece like so. This is going to make up the nictitating membrane. Now, the way this is going to be done, I'm going to use the little piece of epoxy that's on the modeling tool, bring it in to the corner of the deer's eye, place it against the glass using a brush that has been dipped into the isopropyl alcohol. After I'm able to draw away the modeling tool, I get in with the brush and I want to press it against the eye. Again, the brush has been soaked in or dipped into the isopropyl alcohol. Now what I'm doing with the brush is I'm thinning the epoxy out. I'm also spreading it quite, quite a bit, as you can see. And that will be taken away not to worry. For now I'm going to use my X-Acto knife and I'm going to simply start carving or cutting, slicing a good portion into the epoxy. Now using the modeling tool, by the way I have let the brown epoxy on the eyelids fully dry before beginning this, por this, this portion right here. Now cleaning this off the eye. It doesn't matter if it was removed a little crooked because it's still very, very thick. Okay? And I'm going to dip the modeling tool into the alcohol. Get in here now and begin to press the epoxy down into place against the eye. I'm also going to start shaping it. Remember, it goes in at an angle towards the top of the eye. Like so. I'm going to continue to shape with a brush that's been dipped into the alcohol. Now this is going to be done. First, I'm going to clean off the glass. I want to make sure there's no other epoxy on the glass that's not needed or wanted. I want to get that off. Now I'm going to start shaping the third eyelid, the nictitating membrane with a brush that has been dipped in alcohol. There's a little piece of just a wee bit of there we go. Epoxy that needed to be removed. Now I'm coming in and I'm going to start shaping. So I'm going to clean off the eye and reposition the camera so you can see it directly from the front. And here we have the nictitating membrane in place on the deer's eye. That's all that needs to show. That's all that should be there. Now when this starts setting up a little bit, I'll flatten it out again with the modeling tool, trim it up again, and again smooth it with the isopropyl alcohol. But in the meantime, there it is, a nictitating membrane applied using sculpting epoxy. And after some final adjusting, fine tuning, you can now see that the white that was once showing at the front of the eye is gone. Replaced now with the nictitating membrane the only part of the eye on the front, besides the iris itself that shows, is the dark brown limbus band. And that's the band that sort of connects the iris to the white sclera of the eye. So there we have it. 
Next up, texturing and then painting. All right, and here we are. Now with the nictitated membrane completely dried. And I'm ready for the next step. The bare skin of the face is sealed using polytranspar spray lac of fungicidal sealer. I'm going to thoroughly shake the can. Mix up all the ingredients inside of it. Now, with my finger, I want to I want to spray the bare skin around the eyes. So with my finger, I get in here to block the spray from hitting the glass. Hold the can back about six inches or so. Give a couple of spritzes. Go underneath the finger. Go there. I'm going to get a rag and wipe off the excess off the hair. Don't want it to set on the hair. And you can see it's already hit the bare skin at the front of the eye by that shine. Now to get the front of the eye, it's a simple matter of just, I just cover the eye again. And this time spray from the front. And this just keeps it off the glass. Pat away some of the excess so that it dries flat. To apply this to the nose pad, first I block the hair on the lower jaw with a cloth. And give a little shot. Just a couple of light shots is all it takes. Now I block the hair in the nostril. Hit the nostril wing on the outside. Go to the opposite side. Do the same. Let me rearrange myself here. Okay. There we are. I'll wipe it off the hair. And as can be seen here, the lower lip was built up ever so slightly with the same dark epoxy that was used to construct the nictitating membranes. Now this is allowed to dry for a couple of hours or so. Why is this done? Real simple. Before I apply paint to the bare skin, I use oil paint, I want to be sure that the skin is sealed. What it also does, it also darkens the brown skin as you can see, kind of makes it pop, kind of brings it up to the surface just a little more. Same thing with the nose pad. Now I've had students ask me, well, gee, after you do that, do you really need to paint the nose? Well, yeah, because the nose kind of dries towards the black side, and you really don't want that. Plus, there's going to be Mod Podge texturing of the nose pad and of the lower lid before the paint is applied. But this is what it says it is. It's a fungicidal, it's a sealer. It was actually, it was originally developed for... Uh, you know, sealing um, skin mount fish, but it works just as well to to seal the skin of any mammal, any mammal. And if it's if it's too small an animal that you can uh, it, uh, to spray it on, you can you can spray some onto the surface of the cap, for instance. Okay, spray a little puddle of it onto the surface of a cap, and with an old brush, you can get a brush in there and you can apply it with a brush. Just don't apply it too heavily. That's why I gave quick little spritzes with the spray. And I've been using this stuff since Wasco introduced it years ago. And it does great. It 
not only keeps the paint from absorbing too much into the skin, it keeps the Mod Podge from be being sucked into the skin. It allows the Mod Podge to dry more evenly and at a better rate of, uh, uh, at a better, or actually makes it, uh, uh, gives it a better drying rate. Um, sometimes it's hard to describe exactly what it does, but it's a great way to seal the bare skin before any other applications of any other uh, texturing technique or paint is added to the mount. What I've got here now is Mod Podge and a 1cc syringe. Now you can get these syringes from various sellers on eBay. That's where that's where I got these. All you gotta do is open up your Mod Podge. It sticks a little. Yeah, because it's glue. Now in order to pull the glue up into the, into the syringe, these are removable. Uh, small needles from these 1cc syringes. So it makes it real easy to extract the glue from the container. All is needed is to, the glue is shaken up first. Then all that's needed is to dip the tip of the syringe into the glue, pull up on the plunger. You can see the glue fills the plunger. I wipe off the excess now before beginning anything, the first thing I want to do is take the cover off the needle. Now the needle has got a very, very, very sharp point. And I want to take that down for use with the Mod Podge. Why do I take down the point? I don't want to run the tip of the needle into the skin of the deer. I want it to be rounded off. Like so. The sharpness is gone. Now before I put the needle back onto the syringe, I put the cap back on. Reason for that is I want to press it down into tight contact with the syringe and I don't want a dull needle especially driven into my finger. All right, put that on down good and tight. And now I remove the cap from the needle. Start moving the plunger down so I get the glue coming out the tip as you can see here pull back on the plunger just a bit wipe away that excess and now we begin to begin alright now I press lightly on the plunger to start the flow of the glue I start at the back of the eyelids eyelid and work my way forward putting out additional drops of glue as I go now because it is so thick it won't continue to just run out of the needle it needs to be coaxed out little by little now, you could do this with the tip of a fine brush if you're so inclined. I like using the tip of a needle. You get a little more control this way. This is this is this works for me. It doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Got to get around those feeler hairs.
I go all the way to the very corner, making the little drops smaller as I go along. Now, where they blend together, don't sweat it. Once it's painted, uh, it's, it's not going to look terrible. I want to put a little more... I, whoops, that went right onto the eyelash. Don't want that. Come on, off you get. There we go. Got to get under the eyelashes to get to the very back of the eyelid. And remove it from the eyelash again. Onto the nose pad. After the second lower lid was treated with the Mod Podge, I now go to the bottom of the nose pad. What I want to do is I want to add height to the nodules, but I don't want to just throw them on randomly. I'm following the exact nodules that are on the nose pad. Nice thing with this is you can actually get the glue to the shape you want by dragging the tip of the needle along as you go. Because they're not all round, some are all the kind of abstract in shape. Now on the bottom you don't want them too large. Okay. One of the things I also do after the application of the little nodules is complete and they're dried, only after they're totally dried, I'll go over with a fine brush the lower lip with a layer of Mod Podge. And you'll see that in another little video. Now, I keep going until I reach about the halfway point. Then I turn it back, up, uh, back right side up, and I continue on the upper portion of the nose pad. I'm just going to continue this along until it's complete. And you don't have to watch the entire process because it's kind of like watching paint dry. Watching glue being, at, being applied is akin to watching glue dry. So I'll see you when I'm done. Another advantage about having this fella upside down or any, any head upside down, you have the ability to add these little nodules to the underside of the nose pad. There are some located there and they show up on some deer more than others. Now the deer I did before this one had a huge amount of bare skin underneath and he had the nodules built up inside the nostril but just a bit, along, just along the front edge. But being upside down really gives you an opportunity to get there and to be able to see what you're doing a lot closer. Also, one other thing, as you're going along, because this, this is time consuming, you can see where some of the nodules, the applications to the nodules where the glue has begun to dry and sunk down a little bit, you can add to it. But don't go, don't go overboard. They don't need to be overly large. Another thing is, these needles, uh, we were able to purchase them uh, from an online seller on, I believe it was either Amazon or eBay, but you can get them online. Uh, they come from China, so... Uh, it's hard to get them anymore in this country without a prescription. And unless you're diabetic and use insulin in a bottle, uh, you can't get them anymore. You can't just go into a CVS or Rite Aid and buy a bag or two of them. Too many people have taken advantage of that and ruined it for everyone else. I mean, this to me, this is a legitimate market 
for these needles. Uh, you can find needles and syringes at local ag stores, agriculture supply. Problem is, you can't get this fine a needle. So that's why I turn to online sellers. So far it's perfectly legal to have them imported. But you need to be aware that you can't just walk into a pharmacy and ask for needles. After I come up the center, I begin to go off each of the sides and work my way toward the center. It's just it's just the routine I have, it's the way I do it. To me, there's no shortcuts to quality. You can use the nose roller with the pattern on it if you want. But with that, you're just putting a coating of epoxy, sculpting epoxy, over the nose pad. You're burying the nose pad. With this, the nose pad is not being buried, it's being enhanced. Like I say, after I come up halfway, I start going off one side to the other. Back and forth. Keeps you from getting too symmetrical. These little nodules are not really symmetrical. You don't want to start creating an even pattern. Okay? You want and you and you don't want them all round, as I said earlier. Some are elongated like this one here and up at the top I will have some connecting dots if I connect the dots not all but a couple can connect you look at your photo references and then learn how to read the skin you read the skin you're going to be ahead of the game. And reading the skin means seeing the markings in the nose pad that are there that were caused by the original nose pad texture and just start replicating it. Also, you notice that the glue comes out of one side, or one, yeah, one side of the syringe and not off the very tip. And that is a great help in laying down the Mod Podge. Because the syringe needle is made at an angle. And we're just filing the tip off, the sharpest tip, so that it doesn't dig into the skin. Now, if you wanted it to come out of the very tip of this needle, you could grind it away with a Dremel and use a grinding uh, bit on a Dremel motor tool. That would do better than trying to file the opening by hand. Now here I'm just going to add to some of them that have dried already. Just a little bit. Now I, I tap the plunger. This way it's not really being pressed. I just, I just tap it. Tap, tap. And light taps. Love taps. And I'll continue on until it's done. All right, I've just applied a second layer of little glue dots over the first to the eyelids to help enhance those a little more. The nose has had a couple more applications to the nodules just to kind of beef up the texture a little bit, especially along the top edge. And uh, he will be allowed to 
fully dry. And the next thing, when I come back, he'll get a coating of Mod Podge over the nose pad. And that will blend all these individual dots together. To start, I'm going to use this 10 aught fine artist brush to apply Mod Podge to the lower eyelids. This will have a twofold purpose. One, it will bring together the individual little nodules, texturing balls, that I applied to the lower lid. And two, it will give the lower lid some body. It will give the lower lid some pronunciation. Again, keep the glue out of the eyelashes. And I'm going to continue this all the way to the to the back of the eye. Now both eyelids have been textured and coated with Mod Podge. Down to the nose pad. Next. I take a another fine brush, not as fine as, as a 10 -o. This is just a simple double O round artist brush. I coat the work done to the lower lid, lower lip, the lower lip at the front with a coating of Mod Podge. Nice even coating. And it will settle into the little details that were scribed into the epoxy. Doesn't need to be thick. None of this needs to be thick. In fact, if you put it on a little too thick, it's just not going to look right. It needs to be built up in smaller, or I should say in thinner layers. Now, as to the bottom, I'm going to start putting Mod Podge over the bottom of the nose pad. This will, this step will blend all the nodules together and make the nose pad look like a single anatomical unit which is what it is. If you can avoid getting the Mod Podge into the little dimples with the white hair so much the better but if they if they get covered not to worry as you can see the Mod Podge Podge blends clear. And I'll keep at this until the entire nose pad is covered and the deer is back up or turned back to the upright position. And here we have it. Mod Podge is put on to the very edge of the hairs. And a little bit was even put deep into each nostril to coat the interior nostril and give it a little gloss before the final painting. Now this, I will allow this to set up fully. And when I come down, I'll determine if I'm going to give it a second coat. I usually get away with two coats, sometimes three. Very rarely are you able to get away with just one coat. But we shall see what we shall see when I see it again. Now as can be seen in this reference photo, what we've done, what I've done by filling in the little nodules, I'm creating this same surface texture that you can see here where well, you can see the nodules, but they do not dominate the nose pad, okay? And that's just one photo, all right? Well, here's another. And again, while the nodules are definitely there, they do not dominate the nose pad. 
That's what going over it with a coating of Mod Podge does. It tends to level it off and make it look more meaty rather than man-made. Now what you can see here is I will be putting another layer of Mod Podge over this just to give it a little more fuller, more fleshy look that the nose pads on the reference of Live Deer exhibit. To prep the ear interior to restore color and balance the color, I first tape the hair on the bottom of the ear, the bottom of the front of the ear, tape it down with some blue painter's tape, and my finger holding the hair on the outer edge away, I take some plaid brand of the Patricia Nimox clear acrylic sealer, and this is matte. And I want to spray down into the ear channel. A couple of spritzes, quick spritzes. And then I want to spray the skin on the interior of the ear. And we go up. Next, while the sealer is tacking up, while it's still fairly wet, I'm going to go with this Pan Pastels color. It's burnt umber tint, and it's a really nice flesh tone for doing ear interiors. Now the first thing I want to do is apply this to the ear canal that I just sprayed with the matte sealer. Now there's nothing neat about this, it's just I'm just going to get in, I'm going to stick this powder down and have it adhere to the wet plastic reason I'm using this, I'm trying this, I did it on the other ear and it worked very well. I don't know many paints that would adhere to this type of flexible plastic. Okay, so I figure my best bet might be to go with the Pan Pastels on an artist brush, a flat artist brush. This is a cheapo artist brush, more like a cheap chip chip brush. It's part of that set I got from Harbor Freight. And while the rest of the skin is still damp, I want to get in and add some additional color. I'm using the official applicator for Pan Pastels. I'm going to drag it along where there's just the bare skin of the ear. Where the matte sealer made contact. Now this comes out of the hair a lot easier than paint will. This is going to coat this skin that's showing the hard deep red of the ear liners, showing it through a little too dark. And this is going to tone it. Tone it down beautifully. Now I'm going to get in closer and apply this off camera, but you get the general idea and I'll show you what it looks like when it's finished. Now as it's being applied, you can get a softer brush, brush it out of the hair. Blow the excess off. Now you want to get the spray, you want to get in here again and give it a light mist overall.
And before that completely sets, we'll add another layer of the pan pastels. But you can see how it's turned it from a red to a flesh tone. And that's really the look that you want. You don't want that deep red it had before, but the flesh tone it has now is much, much nicer. And I'll be adding some more as soon as that begins to tack up a little bit. Now, I was using my denture brush that I've, you've seen used before to brush this out. I also used my brass brush, and then I grabbed my Kepper Tools brush with the conical tip brush and roll the hair onto it and pulled. That got the spray sealer out of the hair and was able to fluff it. Let's see if this looks without the light. Eh, kind of on a dark side. All right, let's reduce the light a little bit. And here we go. There we go. And that seemed to really give a good grooming to the ear hair. Oh, it seems all these little oddball brushes I own really do a great job. And brush the spray out of the hair of the ears. That helps straighten it out. There we go. I wipe off the excess powder from the hair with my fingers. And I just keep brushing it until all the powder is gone from the hair. But that's a great way to tone down the heavy red ear liners, the heavy red color of the ear liners that were used in this little guy. As well as adding color and a little bit of texture to the inner ear detail of the ear canal. Pretty good method. I like it. Well gang, here we are at the end of another video. Um, I didn't expect it to take as long as it has, but I believe in giving all the information that I can to the viewer. Uh, those of you viewing this, I look at you as students. And whenever I have a student here wanting to learn what I know, I give them all the information they can handle and then some. Uh, in uh, the next video, which will be Finishing the White Tail Part 3, <laughs> I'm going to take you through my steps on restoring the color of the whitetail using oil paints. Um, I'll also take you through my finishing steps for the back of the deer, something most people don't bother with. Uh, some do. I do, for sure. And uh, if there's time, uh, I will take you through uh, enhancing and rejuvenating the velvet in these antlers using electrostatic rayon flocking. Uh, I've bought several different brands with several different color shades, uh, hopefully to find one that I can use on this little fella, and I have. So you will see how to flock antlers. Uh, what, it doesn't matter if, if, it's, if it's rejuvenating the flocking of an existing set of antlers, or if you want to create a set of flocked antlers for yourself, at least you'll have a working knowledge on how to do that. Um, in the meantime, I've got to get started with part three, finishing the whitetail deer painting. So hang in. It's probably going to be another long one. I thank you all for watching. We'll see you later.